We hope the last few days have been life-giving for you and that you are refreshed and ready to go where the Spirit is calling you today. We are so excited to worship together and to hear and learn from the esteemed Reverend Tutu Van Firth. Pray with me as we enter into another day of fellowship and communion. O oh God, we give you thanks and praise. We thank you for worship, learning, and fellowship. Now we ask that you would open us up so that we can be receptive to what your spirit is saying. We know that where your spirit dwells, there is liberty. So in this moment, we ask that you would liberate us from all of those things that seek to constrict, control, and constrain us now in this moment. We ask that you would liberate us and free us from the chains of oppression and empower us to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you as we seek the liberation of all of our siblings. Oh God, we give you thanks and praise. Amen. Tu amor Pasando las fronteras Tu amor Que rompe las barreras Que alcanza las estrellas Y nada se compara Tu amor Tu amor no importa la tormenta que enfrentamos Con su poder juntos vencimos Mirando a los cielos esperando We know that this is love that won't let go oh, 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 oh. How great the love that leads us Tu amor renueva vida Tu amor Que rompe las barreras Que alcanza las estrellas Y nada se compara Tu amor Tu amor Levántense hermanos y hermanas For in his eyes Somos familia Miramos a los cielos esperando
The 2021 conference theme is rooted in Micah 6, 8. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Micah 6, 8, NRSV. By the Spirit's direction, we are catalyzing a movement towards oneness. Oneness is not the eradication or diminishment of identity, experience, or expression. It is the restoration of all things in the finished work of Christ, the consummate celebration of the coming kingdom. Oneness is achieved through the pursuit of justice, in light of mercy, the humble walk on which we embark as followers of Christ, led by the Spirit, to continue building a world where equity is realized for all of God's children. As LGBTQ Christians and allies, we must embody this vision through the work of relational justice, growing in communities such that every marginalized identity is celebrated as valid, beloved, and whole. Join us in reciting the 2021 conference ethos. We strive to be a movement towards oneness where all belong unconditionally. We seek justice in every sphere, knowing that all have inherent worth. We embody compassion for the impressed so that all are made whole. We reflect the good news of Christ's love, believing all are God's beloved. May all we do be done in pursuit of equity and in light of mercy, and walking humbly in the spirit of the living God, may their kingdom be made manifest in our lives, relationships, and world. Amen.
Hi, my name is Lauren Mosher, and I'm the Operations Director for Q Christian Fellowship. Even though this conference is virtual this year, we will have nearly 200 volunteers who have contributed their time, their efforts, and their talents to make sure that this conference weekend is a success. We cannot do this without our volunteers. And that's why every year our community nominates one exceptional volunteer for the Brian Eckstein Award. This year, we are excited to present the Brian Eckstein Award to Michael Jennings. Michael has been a committed, passionate, and engaged volunteer. With you leading Q Chats, Sexuality and Spirituality, and the trans and gender expansive community groups, has connected with and impacted over 40 individuals within the Q Christian community. This spring, Michael will lead their fourth Q Christian community group. Michael has also contributed to QCF's Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee, working alongside QCF staff to develop community group content for the trans and gender expansive community and facilitated summer book studies. Those who nominated Michael for this award described them as having gone above and beyond in their leadership and care. So from the Q Christian staff, we want to say thank you so much to Michael, but we also want to say thank you to all of the volunteers who have gone above and beyond in their leadership and care for this community to create radical inclusion among LGBTQ plus people across the world. Please join me in welcoming someone who identifies as a priest, a mother, a wife, a writer, a theologian, and public speaker, and an artist. Um, welcome, Reverend Mfo Tutu Van Firth. Thank you. Um, there's so many things I want to ask you about um, to learn from you and your journey and your vocations and um, your wisdom. So how would you have described yourself as a child, like in five words or less? Oh, wow. In, I guess, in which direction? Very happy-go-lucky. Um, I had a lot of friends um, uh, who I loved. And yeah, I enjoyed my life. <laughs> so um, for me, growing up, um, I was always challenging gender roles. Um, so the teacher would come in and say, I need five boys to come help and, you know, move these desks you know, to this room. And I would say, well, why does it have to be boys? Um, you know, I'm stronger than most of the, most of the kids in here. And so uh, that was me. But growing up, did you engage with gender identity, expression, gender roles? Not that, not that I really remember. Um, but then again, I, I grew up in a household where, um, you know, we were all kind of expected to pitch in and my my parents really for the most part weren't rigid about gender roles although my my mother would say sit like a lady um mm -hmm. but, but um i think they tried hard and i think particularly hard for africans um of their time and age to not be um, it, yeah, that, you know, that way, I mean, I think, you know, my parents' friends were surprised that my dad in the 1960s was changing babies' nappies and, and that he, you know, took on childcare responsibility, which was a woman's job. So right. I, 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 I never felt myself challenging gender roles I you know I I if I did it was kind of low-key I mean I, I do remember that that growing up um that I either wanted to be a firefighter or a ballerina um, <laughs> and, and they you know and they both seemed to kind of fit equally <laughs> I didn't end up being either but also, none that were voiced. So I think I, I, I remember um, reading a piece of wisdom that, that my parents had picked up somewhere, which was find out what your children love to do and then advise them to, to do that. Um, and so I think that, um, that, that, you know, they were thrilled with wherever it was that we um, chose as, as our direction for life and, and very encouraging. 
How did you discern your vocation to become a theologian, to get an MDiv, to become a priest? Um, I think actually it was a, um, a vocation that I spent more time resisting than otherwise. I, you know, um, initially it was it was quite easy because there were we didn't have women clergy in in the Anglican Church in South Africa, and I was in South Africa, and so it just wasn't a topic. Um, and when I was in, in undergrad and the chaplain then suggested that I might have a vocation to ordained ministry, I really didn't want to hear that. I wasn't interested. <laughs> and in any case, I was planning to go back to South Africa. And again, you know, it was another one of those, okay, well, you know, pass up on that idea. And then after, um, after university, I did a lot of work in the nonprofit sector, doing um, running projects and programs and so on and so forth. And um, through my work there, what I found that I was doing was well, actually, my my I was I was at one point describing work I was doing in a, in a scholarship program. So I was running a scholarship program for refugees from South Africa and Namibia. And um, I was describing my work in the scholarship program and updating my parents on what I was doing. And my dad said, oh, yes, you have a really wonderful ministry there. And I was like, yeah, ministry. <laughs> <laughs> By the time I was in my mid-twenties, I had seen at least a couple of African-American, not because South Africa still didn't have women clergy in our denomination, but African-American women clergy who were people who I looked at and I said, yeah, I could, you know, I could see myself doing this and I can, I can see someone there who is a priest in the way that I might want to be a priest. So your, your father made global headlines um, when he said he would rather go to hell than to a homophobic heaven. Um, and he also le- received a Lifetime Achievement Award for his work seeking justice for LGBTQ um, people. And his, his commitment actually goes further back than that to as early as uh, the 1970s. Um, so he's has he always been affirming of LGBTQ people? I have never known him not to be. I guess also kind of looking back, um, I don't know how many LGBTQ um, plus people were out um or you know would would have said anything in in a setting in which in which he um you know was was um, had any kind of a role um to where he had to have a thought about it um but i i, I do distinctly remember a couple of things like from my early teenage years one was um was actually a, a couple who were um, being completely subversive of, of apartheid South Africa. Um, he had come back from um, the, the, this couple, it was a couple of uh, two white men who had adopted because they couldn't, they couldn't literally adopt in the South African continent, but they, they had adopted uh, um, a, 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 either one young black man or two or um, brothers um, who, you know, they had taken in and were looking after and were school fees and so on and so forth. And they wanted a um, kind of a blessing on the adoption and and the the their family and he came back and he um and the thing that was funny to me kind of in retrospect was that what what was striking to him wasn't that it was two men, but that it was an adoption across the color line and that these mm-hmm. were people who were making an adoption across the color line. And and, and so for me, um, 
that that also became okay the thing that's remarkable here um is is that that they're willing to go against the government to affirm these young men, uh, young boys, um, as opposed to the thing that is remarkable is that it's two men who who are together as a couple. If you asked me in my head growing up, I would have said I was heterosexual. And even at this point in my life, I find kind of the, the tag of being bisexual as a challenging tag because my relationship isn't isn't um, solely or primarily about sex. Um, it's in, it is primarily about this person who I love and respect and admire with whom I am in relationship. And the fact that this person who I love and respect and admire is a woman, um, it's really not a big deal. <laughs> is, um, opting to use the label, um, is that important in the sense that it can raise awareness about the identity that's not straight and not gay, you know, that there is a non-binary experience of sexuality? Yes, I you know I don't uh, in in that regard I don't object to the label. I just I I just I find that the label sits a little bit uncomfortably on my shoulders because as much as my relationship with my husband wasn't primarily and only about sex, my relationship with my wife is not primarily and only about sex. I think too often as LGBTQ people were you know were looked at as you know, we are who we're with, you know, so if you're a woman with another woman, then you're gay. If you're a woman with a man, then you're straight. And so that sort of in-between space of, you know, um, not choosing based on gender, that yeah. sort of identity that, um, that both you and I inhabit, um, I just think is so critical. And so I'm just wondering how you came to identify or how you came to learn that you were you were not having a binary experience of sexuality yeah well we kissed <laughs> like, okay i'm kissing you you're not a man <laughs> and this, is this your wife or is this someone that you met oh my <laughs> wife okay so how about how did that come about? How did you meet? Um, <laughs> oh, um, so I was um, in South Africa. I was uh, back in South Africa as the executive director of the Desmond and Leah Tutu Legacy Foundation. Um, and um, in that role, I had been invited to the Dutch embassy in Pretoria because there was this thing called Tutus on Tour. And it was um, the, the Freie University in Amsterdam had um, created a Desmond Tutu chair that was or eight Desmond Tutu chairs um, in various faculties across the university. And, um, and so the professors, the, the, chair, the chairholders for those um, chairs were in South Africa visiting various um, academic institutions with which they would be working in the future. Um, students would be able to get a dual doctorate between Frey University and a South African institution. And my wife was one of the professors who was part of that group. Um, I had been awarded um, a couple of years before a scholarship to study in the Netherlands at Frey University and the theology professor who I was going to be studying with was also part of the tour group. And then I was going to be going to the Netherlands and, and my wife said, oh, you know, when you come, if you need some help, you know, finding housing and doing other things to get you settled for the amount of time that you're going to be there. 
look me up. And she is very, um, how do you say? Um, she's one of those, you know, hyper organized, complete, you know, complete with checklists kind of people. Um, and so by the time I got here for the summer, she'd arranged childcare and housing and, you know, like all of these other things that I was, I had no idea how I was going to figure those things out. And so many of us within um, QCF's community, um, we've struggled with non-affirming parents and it doesn't seem like that was your experience. It's very encouraging to see. Can you share a moment where um, affirmation from your parents was particularly impactful? I think all the way along, actually, for me, I divorced um, a couple of years before um, Marceline and I got together and got married and so on. Um, and um, my parents had a really hard time with the divorce. I think that was um, really devastating for them. But they had no problem at all with the marriage. The, um, no, not true. The, they did have a problem with the marriage. My mother in particular had a problem with the marriage. And her problem with the marriage was you're getting married to this person, what's going to happen with my grandchildren? Right. Um, and, and once it was clear that, that we absolutely had taken her grandchildren into account in, in thinking about our relationship, then she was fine. We got married here in the Netherlands, a, a registry office marriage in the Netherlands, but then we had a celebration the following year in, in, in Cape Town, in Franschhoek, in the Western Cape, and my parents were very much a part of our celebration as well, even though my dad had recently been quite ill and um, mm. recovering from an illness at the time. But um, also the, the Anglican Church in South Africa had decided um, at that point I was still living in South Africa and I was still serving under license in a congregation in, in um, the Diocese of Saldana Bay. And the bishops on hearing of my marriage um, um, insisted that the local bishop revoke my license to to officiate and preach in, in that diocese. And, and so, you know, the, the question that that bishop, that my, my, my bishop in Salvadana Bay had asked was, okay, so if this were my child, what do you advise? That am I not supposed to go to the, to the wedding? Am I not supposed to be any part of that? And the advice was, well, okay, if, you know, if it's your child and you feel like you can, you want to go, okay, fine, you could go. Um, but, you know, you're not allowed to have any official role in that, in the wedding. Um, the, that particular bishop, to his great credit, actually did come to our celebration. Um, and the morning of the celebration, before we had the actual kind of public celebration, we had a, a family gathering and we had a, um, a Eucharist together as a family. And my my dad prayed over us, um, so that um, and that was really important. Lots and lots of tears and um, joy and sadness, and and you know, part of his prayer was um, that as a Christian community, um, that um, that as Christian communities in all the world, that we become fully affirming of all God's children in, you know, in all of their expressions of love. Amen. Mm -hmm. um, so for LGBTQ people, often the celebration of finding love often comes with some losses, um, difficult implications for us in other spheres. For you, your wedding had um, grave implications for your vocation. Um, can you describe what happened and how you processed through that? Um, well, so, you know, as I, as I said, the, um, 
the the bishop of that diocese of Saldana Bay was was advised to revoke my license. So I'm still canonically resident in the diocese of Washington, in the U.S. And so I was um, serving under license in 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 Cape Town, and and I never. Um, I never gave up my my canonical residency in the U.S. Um, and so that means technically I'm still a priest in good standing. Um, but it did mean that I could no longer practice as a priest in South Africa. Um, it wasn't in, you know, in one way, it, it wasn't a huge big deal because my primary ministry at the time was, was as executive director in the foundation. Um, and, you know, when I, when I wasn't in South Africa, if I was in the US or if I was anywhere else in the world um, where um, my ministry is acceptable, I could still minister and serve as a priest. Um, but it had, um, a kind of a, a different set of emotional implications. So one of the things um, uh, about it was that when my father became Archbishop of Cape Town, there were three things that he set as priorities. One was the end of apartheid, was working to, to end apartheid. The second was the ordination of women. And the, the third was full inclusion of LGBTQIA people in all, in all of the um, ranks of ministry in the church, that, that, that it was to not be an issue any longer. Um, the, the first two actually were accomplished. <laughs> um, and it was just the third. Um, and um, I had had an experience of, uh, a few years earlier of um, serving at the altar with my dad um, that we had come celebrated the Eucharist at, at, um, in the church that my grandmother had helped to build. Um, and, and so and and one of one of the friends who had attended that worship said you know uh, she she had um she had been the person who had um held the debate who had um held the position for the ordination of women when it had come up for debate in the time when it was finally um ratified when the ordination of women was finally ratified in the church of the province of southern africa and she's, you know, and she said she was just, she was so moved to see me and my dad together at the altar and saying that, you know, when, when he had expressed that dream and when he had done all of the work that he had done to um, make the ordination of women possible in the church, that um, he, he hadn't thought of it as something that he was doing for himself and his daughter, that, it, you know, that that wasn't part of the vision. Um, and yet this is what it had been, what it had become. And, and so this moment was kind of a, 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 a big reversal um, for us, just, you know, kind of an emotional reversal. Um, and then we, my dad typically has a daily Eucharist at home. Um, and when I was living in Cape Town, we would just trade who was going to officiate on one day or another who felt like officiating. Um, and, um, and so then we, you know, kind of hit a kind of a, a bump or a roadblock or something because there was one day when it was like, okay, um, do you want to officiate? Wait, can you officiate? Uh, you know, I'm not quite sure how things are going to go here. Um, and that was just a, a real um, heart heartbreak as well. And I, you know, I, as as I say, you know, the the um, the license to do something that I'm, you know, that I in, do infrequently in a country where I no longer live. Um, uh, really shouldn't matter that much, but it does. Um, and it, it, it matters to me personally, 
Um, but it also matters to me in the respect of all of the other um, um, LGBT um, people in the church in South Africa who aren't allowed to exercise their full ministry or the fullness of their ministry. Um, and, you know, and, and all, all are given the choice. You can be celibate or um, you can, um, or, or you can be um, partnered but if you're partnered, then you can't be a clergy person. I believe that the sexual, our sexual expression is a gift from God as much as I believe that um, the call from, for celibacy is also a gift from God. Um, but it, you know, God is quite um, specific in how God gifts us. So, you know, the, the choice to be celibate, the vocation of celibacy is a vocation given to particular people at particular times in their lives for God's own best reasons. Then it's not a requirement that, that should be imposed externally. How have you and how has your dad kind of reconciled, um, you know, what the religious space has taught in terms of scripture, in terms of, you know, God's design, if you will, and your experience of people, people who are LGBTQ. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that um, kind of the idea of scripture is, is the idea of, um, taking the message as a whole um, rather than pulling threads out of the message and so and you know particularly as christians who look at the um christian testament so so the um um the the gospels and the acts and the letters um that that what they describe to us when taken as a whole is a description of God's love for God's creation. And the idea that God creates in, 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 um, in a kind of an explosion of variety, um, that, that there is so much more in the world that we have yet to discover um, than we have already discovered. And, and so um, that what we learn is that we as human beings really like to kind of contain things. We want to um, bring, you know, like we want to, to confine God to the straight and narrow um, where God wants um, a world of flourishing and when we look at at all creation when we look at all nature um, as being expressions of who God is and how God operates in creation um, there's you know there's every expression of um, of beauty, of color, of variety, of multiplicity, um, of, of things that we hadn't thought of, of combinations um, that we wouldn't necessarily conceive on our own. And so um, I find no challenge in reconciling um, the God of scripture um, who is a God of love um, with, uh, with a love that is not confined to um, a gender binary. Um, and I have absolutely um, no problem either um, with um, allowing myself the understanding that um, that we as human beings actually don't operate on a binary. It's not 
either or. Um, that, that actually, you know, even in terms of, of sexual attraction, sexual attraction exists on a spectrum um, rather than, you know, you like this or you like that. So our conference theme for this year is rooted in Micah 6, 8. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? And your family has always relentlessly pursued justice, um, even when it wasn't popular to do so. Um, without fail, your father always prioritized caring for the people on the margin. Um, how has that um, impacted your journey and your work? Um, I think the, the um, thing that I, I feel like I learned from my parents or the, um, the gifts that I received from my parents is, is, um, is to do the next right thing. Um, and, and so it's not necessarily being able to see all the way to, to where the journey ends. But, um, but sometimes it's just being able to do the thing in front of you that is the right thing to do. Um, and that my parents have been very firmly rooted in love. And I, um, one, of the, one of the things I discovered in, in, in being executive director of the, of the Legacy Foundation, of their Legacy Foundation, um, was just how much, how many things my parents were involved in, um, how many justice issues they took up left, right, and center. And, um, and at first glance, you know, you question, well, my goodness, what does um, the potato, the Irish potato famine have to do with the um, Biafran civil war, have to do with flooding in Tahiti, have to do with um, the melting polar ice cap, have to do with political prisoners in Ethiopia, you know, uh, and on and on and on. And that, that actually, um, when when one gets to understand that what what ties them all together is um, that 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 what my parents have been interested in doing is living God's love. How mm -hmm. do you know? How do we? How do we? Um, not just put the take it as words in our mouth. Um, but actually embody um, God's love. And, and, and so when you choose which side to be on um, or when you choose whether to take sides or not, um, the, the first question that, that you ask is, you know, does, does, is this how I make God's love evident in the world? And and then when you, when you ask that question, then all of these disparate things come together and all of the seemingly disparate concerns become a, a single concern um, that, that our, our task as Christians is to be ambassadors of God's shalom. Mm, amen. So you've mentioned several times um, growing up um, during apartheid um, and your father wrote, if the church after the victory over apartheid is looking for a worthy moral crusade, then this is it, the fight against homophobia and heterosexism. Um, it's a powerful statement, one that recognizes that we must always be continually seeking justice in every circumstance, as you've been saying. Um, how did growing up during apartheid impact um, your worldview and your understanding of seeking justice in light of mercy? I, um, I guess the, the challenge is not having another lifetime with which to compare, um, you know, other than my, my own lifetime. 
Um, I think the, you know, standing here in 2020, in a year in which there has been so much upheaval all over the world, um, that the both in terms of racial upheaval, but also in terms of the devastation that has been wrought by the um, by the COVID pandemic. Um, I I think that that what what I have really come to understand. Um, is how um, how injustice is so intimately interwoven um, that every every thread of injustice just serves to reinforce another thread of injustice, um, and so the um, our temptation is so often to atomize our struggles. Um, and the reality is that if we, if, if we ever hope to flourish, then what is needed is for all of us to flourish. We don't, we don't get to, to um, we don't get to live our best lives alone. Um, uh, we don't, you know, like the, if we really want to live our best lives, then we must be invested in making sure that, um, that all of us are living our best lives, because that is truly the, um, the acme, the epitome, the, the apex of, of living a best life. Um, the, 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 my father, says the quality of life on our planet is simply the quality of each individual life on our planet. And so if we want to enhance the quality of life, um, then we must enhance the quality of life for all of us. Amen. That's, that's a major focus for what we're trying to learn together in this conference is, you know, that we're all one. And so the problems of one of us is a problem of all of us because we must all be seeking seeking justice together. When we face people, you know, denouncing who we are or you know what this justice that we're we're seeking, um, how have you faced that? I mean, you didn't face it with your family, but I'm sure that there were many in the diocese, many um, that you encountered that. Um, pushed back. Um, how did you respond and how did you um, deal with that? I actually have been so fortunate. Um, I have really faced minimal pushback, minimal um, challenge to my way of being, but I I don't know whether that is in part because I am not apologetic, but I am. I have also been very intentional about my choices. I mean, I do remember really distinctly running the conversation in my head on my relationship with my now wife while we were still girlfriends and trying to figure out at which point I introduced our relationship to my children. And the, the, the question for me, you know, the, the way I framed the question for myself was, okay, if this were a man, what would you be saying about her at this point? Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, and that was a, a helpful question for me because then it, you know kind of it, it kept me honest in 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 how i was engaging in that relationship because i really haven't faced significant pushback significant danger i don't really feel qualified to say oh okay you know when you face pushback you need to just stand up and say you know um this is my life and i'm entitled to live my life the way i live my life 
um, because I say that from a place of, of, um, of, of comfort and safety. Mm -hmm. um, and for the people who are not in places of comfort and safety, um, I, you know, I, I feel that, um, that my role is to, um, is to stand up and speak because I can, um, you know, on behalf of those who can't. So what is your hope for LGBTQ Christians who may have in the past or may still be grappling with what is God calling them to be in the world? That God is always standing with an invitation to us um, and, and an invitation to us to, um, to fullness of life. Um, and in, in terms of, of the grappling, I think it is the role of those of us who are in places of safety to speak out for those who are in places of danger um, and to um, continue to challenge our faith communities um, to, to be um, present and vociferous in defense of God's children in danger. We as Christian communities have a lot to answer for um, in, in terms of, um, of the experiences of LGBT um, plus um, people. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, may we as LGBTQ Christians strive to let our light shine um, as you have throughout your life and may we bear witness to the explosion of variety that um, is God's creation. And my prayer is that we would bear prophetic witness to the breadth of God's love and to the radical diversity of the kingdom of God that is to come. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. You gave us these bodies and you called them good. You gave us these bodies and you called them good. Right now, we'd like to enter into a time of celebration and lament by coming together in prayer to share our gratitudes and sorrows and needs. We invite you to walk with us and share your own prayers in the chat if you'd like. Let us pray. Oh God, we give thanks for who you are, our queer, beloved creator, lover, companion and guide who knows us inside out and loves us completely. God, we give thanks that you got skin. You got skin and become flesh in Jesus Christ to show us the sacred loveliness of our own bodies and this whole dear sweet world. Glory to God. Shalom for all. Oh God, we pray for those who are hurting amongst us and all around us who have not been loved, body and soul. We pray especially for the most vulnerable, for LGBTQIA teens at risk for suicide, for black trans women who are so often targeted, attacked and killed. Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy. God, we ask for your strength and the courage to love ourselves and others as you have loved us, to stand up for what is right as you have stood up for us, and to walk beside those who need us the most. God of extravagant love, hear our prayers. We are easily damaged. 
seen the scars That's just scratching the surface More beneath where those are You gave us these bodies And you called them good You gave us these bodies And you called them good May we love them as you do Let us love them as you do Inside, outside, through and through Let us love them as you do But we do so much damage Have you seen the scars? We keep hurting each other Sometimes that's just how we are You gave us these bodies And you called them good You gave us these bodies And you called them good Hello everyone at conference. Uh, my name is Christopher. I am the development manager for Q Christian Fellowship. Uh, I'm from Texas. I was raised Catholic. I am gay. My pronouns are he, him, and Q Christian Fellowship changed my life just a few years ago when I first encountered it. And now I am so grateful to be working uh, part-time with our staff to be helping raise funds to support amazing work uh, that the staff does just like this conference. And so this next session is going to just be a brief way for us to talk a little bit more about um, kind of all the work that happens behind the scenes uh, for Q Christian Fellowship and how the support of our volunteers and our financial benefactors help make that work possible. Uh, so we're going to start off with a little interview with Bukola, our executive director, who's here with me. Then we're going to hear from a few more members of our community. And then finally, at the end, there will be an opportunity for you all to jump in and support this amazing work. Uh, so thank you to everyone for sticking through this. And now we will jump in and Bukola will join us. And so she's our executive director. So Bukola, first, if you could just uh, tell us a little bit about how you got involved with Q and uh, what you helped do to lead our, our organization. So I am actually an attorney. Um, I work full time um, for a telecommunications company. And I was on the board of um, Q Christian um, for several years. And I was actually asked by the board to um, take on a role helping to run the organization. And then shortly after that, um, I became the sole executive director last year in, in June. 
So what, like, what message would you want to say to all of the supporters and volunteers uh, who are involved in our work? Yeah, I just want to thank them. I am so grateful for the work um, that everyone puts in for the funds that they, um, they help to steward this organization. Um, and we, we wouldn't be able to do the amount of work that we do if it wasn't for the volunteers and for people who work for a very reduced fee. Um, so we're just so grateful for, for the support. So there's Bukola and I, and there's a few other staff members on our team. We are spread across the country, across multiple time zones. Um, as long as I've been helping with Q, we've always been a remote staff. Um, and so maybe you could just run through and tell us a little bit about the staff and what they do. And a little bit of that is, is oftentimes when people are supporting a church or any kind of nonprofit organization, they're wondering where the funding goes. So obviously we have a staff that, that all of our supporters are supporting, but what do they exactly do? And maybe you could tell us a little bit about them. Sure. So as you said, we, we all work remote. That allows me to be able to be in my unicorn slippers here. Um, <laughs> and and um, there's only actually two full-time staff members of, of QCF, um, Lauren and Nathaniel. Lauren is the operations director. She makes everything go. Um, she's really amazing at it um, because she's just so well-rounded. She has a business background, but she also has a seminary background. And so that allows her to be able to tap into different parts of her skill set in all of her work. Um, she lives in Denver with her partner, Hannah. Awesome. And how about Nathaniel? Yeah, Nathaniel is, um, he wears a lot of hats. So everything that you see or hear or read <laughs> from the organization, he has had some hand in it. Um, he's, a, he's such a pastoral heart um, and he's able to communicate and visually express so much that um, the organization is trying to say in the world and the things that we're trying to do to support and to uplift this community. So we also have Alicia and Alicia is a fellow Texan like me and I met them at conference last year and uh, we hit it off because we're fellow Texans and then when the part-time position opened I remember uh, kind of dreaming with them and talking with them about how great it would be to have them and here we are so can you tell us a little bit about Alicia? Yes so last actually this year it feels like they've always been a part of the team so I forgot but it was just this earlier this year um, that we really needed some administrative support. And so we were able to bring Alicia on board and has been such a help to Lauren in terms of the day-to-day -day management and also with the expansion of our community groups. Um, our community groups have, have grown so quickly from last year to this year. Um, and so having someone kind of shepherding that whole um, program has been extremely helpful and Alicia has been able to step up and, and do that work too. And they also have a seminary background as well. Well, thank you for highlighting the team. Uh, and then I'm here, I think it's my job to, to pull you on camera and make you talk in front of everybody for fundraising <laughs> stuff, right? <laughs> that's, that's what you're good at. Um, no, I think that it's extremely helpful to have you and to have your skill set of you know, creating new communications to donors and things that I just would never think to say <laughs> and never think to share, um, that you're constantly kind of pulling it out of us. And so it's extremely helpful to have you around too. So now is the time that I would ask that everyone might consider uh, investing in our mission in whatever amount you can. Please know that no gift is too small. 80% of our supporters give less than $500 per year, and many of those are giving the level of five, 10, 20, or $25 per month. Whereas other members of our community uh, might be able to start a new monthly gift today of 50 or even $100 per month. So our goal for conference is that 50 people might give a gift of $20 a month or more, or a one-time gift of $250. And altogether, uh, we'd like to raise $30,000. And the way that we'll get there is that a few generous members of our community are matching and doubling all of those gifts up to $15,000. And so that would include all new monthly gifts for the first year. So thank you so much to those of you that are considering donating. Thank you to the handful of you that are providing the double match donation. Um, and just a word about all the other members of our community who may not have the means to support Please know that the greatest gift that you can give is the gift of yourself to our community. And those of us that have the means to support do so because we value you and we love you and we are so happy that you are here with us. 
Um, if you do not have the means to support but would like to help uh, help get support for the organization, please know that you can do a birthday fundraiser. Uh, you can share a giving link with uh, loved ones or allies uh, who may be looking to invest in an important mission and share about the way that we have impacted you. Um, and you could also share your story with us. You could shoot us an email uh, on our website and tell us a little bit about how this organization has helped you and we can use those stories as well. So there's a link that's coming up now uh, that you can follow, qchristian.org slash or dash take action. Um, if, to sign up for an online gift. If you would like to give over the phone, you could actually shoot me a personal text message um, just with your name and that you'd like to sign up for a gift. And I will call each one of you individually back one by one and we will set up your monthly gift or your one-time gift over the phone. So uh, if you wanna click away, you can open a new window because if you'll stick with us during the opportunity that we'd like you to sign up for a gift, um, there will be a musical repertoire by one of our own monthly donors, Bill Patterson, who has put together something specifically for this uh, with a slideshow in the background that our uh, staff have put together um, from past conferences and events and things like that. So thank you so much for considering a contribution and God bless. We thank you for worshiping with us in our worship session today. And now we transition to a time of breakout sessions, affinity groups, and social events. Remember, you can contact our mental health and prayer team anytime if you'd like someone to pray for you or someone with whom you could talk. And as always at the QCF conference, we will be having a group sharing session, a chance for us all to talk about just how much this time means to us as we do our best to grow in the spiritual journey. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you so much for giving us this time of worship and learning, this time to come together and to know we're not alone a time to come together and know that you've called us to do good work, to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with our God. We thank you for that, God, because the truth is we needed the work. We needed to have important work to do as you teach us to love our neighbor, which is every human being with whom we come in contact, to love you, including in the form of Jesus who came to live among us and show us what it means to be fully human. And to love ourselves may be the hardest task of all. And God, we do understand that if we do not learn to love ourselves, we can never love you or love our neighbor. So teach us to have grace and mercy toward our own selves so that we may love you and our neighbors better. This is our prayer in the name of Christ. Amen. 